Welcome to Wind Down Wednesday. Here are your hosts, Jeffrey Tobias Halter and Amanda Hammett. Well, good afternoon. Today we are talking with Tamika Curry-Smith about human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Just a few topics here. Um, My name is Amanda Hammett, and today I am drinking my solid, my favorite, a little um, club soda and vodka. Jeffrey! Yeah, I'm going to have to try that at some point in time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that at some point in time, you know, so it's, you uh, but it's summer. I'm actually enjoying a nice Pinot Grigio with a couple ice cubes. You know, it's, it's hot here in Georgia and you gotta, you gotta stay refreshed. So uh, sometimes I throw a little ice in. I know the wine purists out there are rolling their eyes, but you know what? You got to roll the way you roll. If you live in Georgia, you understand. <laughs> you would certainly add some wine. But today, it is my pleasure to introduce a returning guest and a friend and colleague, Tamika Curry-Smith. Uh, Tamika was one of our first guests on Wine Now Wednesday at that time. And we spoke about returning to the office, inclusion, and belonging in one of our earlier episodes. Today, we're thrilled to welcome her back to talk more about DE&I. But first, an amazing introduction. Uh, Tamika Curry-Smith is a global HR and diversity, equity, and inclusion executive who is currently chief diversity officer at Arm LTD Limited, the world's leading semiconductor IP company. She's also an advisor to Goldman Sachs, where she works with early stage company in in Goldman's asset management division portfolio. Prior to her roles and where I got to know her is leading DE&I at Nike, Mercedes-Benz, Target, and Deloitte. Such an impressive resume and, and so many experiences drawn. She's a lifetime member of the National Black MBA Association, currently serves on the Alumni Board of Directors at the Ross School of Business, as well as the Kellogg School of Management on Inclusion Coalition. Tamika is an entrepreneur leading her own company, the TCS Group, Inc., an HR and DEI consulting firm. Tamika, yes. welcome back to Wind Down Wednesday. How Thank are you, you for that. Thank you. It's so great to be back. Thank you for that long bio read, Jeffrey. Uh, it's always <laughs> a bit odd to hear people uh, talk about um, yourself, uh, but I'm excited to be back and uh, really looking forward to our conversation today. So thanks for having me. Well, wonderful. So you got to share with the audience, what are you drinking today? So the first time I was here, I had a margarita, which is one of my favorite drinks. Now I'm going with red wine, which is probably my second favorite, sometimes my first, depending on what has gone on that week. And this particular wine is called Unshackled, and it's by the Prisoners Wine Company. And um, one of my good friends introduced me to this. They actually have a whole collection of different reds and whites, but um, I'm, I'm working my way through all of their offerings. So this one is called Unshackled. Very cool. That is a fabulous wine, and you need to try others in their collection because I've also had Unshackled, okay. and uh, it is it is uh, shall we say very yummy. Yes, it um, is. So, <laughs> <laughs> Tamika, it's been a while since we've talked. Uh, for our listeners, um, Tamika is uh, is a dear friend. Um, we work together. Uh, gosh, now over 10 years ago, I, you were gracious enough to invite me into Mercedes Benz. Uh, I saw you go on to do some amazing things at Nike, and, and now you've moved in, over into the tech world. So, um, you know what? Tell us what you're currently up to. And I, and I kind of like you to reflect just a little bit. You kind of went from consulting and CPG now to tech. So, you know, kind of give me a give me a good story around that transition and what you see that's different. Yeah, you know, I've been doing DI work at this point for 20 years, as you mentioned, Deloitte to Target to Mercedes-Benz to Nike now in tech. And I think the work is fundamentally really similar. The challenges that organizations are facing um, don't don't vary widely. Where they are along their stage of doing this work, uh, you know, so their organizational readiness, their maturity when it comes to DEI varies. But a lot of the challenges are the same. And so I think for me, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always looking for additional challenges, additional ways to have an impact. And so 
my choices have been somewhat uh, um, purposeful to do the work, but do it in different ways, do it with different organizations and do it in different industries. And one of the industries I had never really um, ventured into was tech. And this pivot that I made to work with ARM um, was twofold. One, in that it, it was in the tech industry, but two, it's with an organization that was earlier on in their um, DEI work and where, you know, for me, I do the work to have an impact to make a difference. And there's something to be said when you can go into an organization and really help build it from scratch. And so in many aspects, I won't say that ARM was previously not doing anything, but I think from uh, taking the work uh, and viewing it as a real strategic driver for the business and the organization, that's where they are now. And and, and I've been a, a part of them making that pivot. And so that that's really been exciting for me. I love this. I, I love kind of your background and, and where you've taken your career. Could we talk a little bit more about ARM, what you're doing, maybe even share a success story? Yeah, I mean, and I can, there's so much work to be done in this space, as I think, as you both know. And when I joined ARM, it's been roughly about a year when I joined. As I mentioned, the organization had done a number of things previously in this space, um, but they were really trying to elevate their commitment to DEI and then more specifically to drive action and to drive change. And so one of the things that they did that I think and wish more organizations would do is to do an assessment. So they brought in an external organization, the Ivy Planning Group, who is um, a a great company that does a lot of DEI work and and really drives it within organizations. But they came in, they did an assessment, both qualitative and quantitative. And what that assessment did is really provided um, a starting point for me to then develop the strategy. So worked across the organization to look at what gaps were identified in that assessment, where our opportunity areas were, and then to work collectively and get the buy-in to say, you know, how do we set up a strategy that allows us to focus on our top priorities and to drive change over time? And so within 90 days of doing that assessment, we had a strategy in place. Um, One of the biggest opportunity areas uh, for ARM, and I think for many organizations, is metrics and accountability. And I believe this is the missing link in many uh, spaces when it comes to DEI work. And so we then moved along that uh, that body of work to say, how would we extend the responsibility for DEI beyond just me or my team or the executive team? And how do we really make the whole organization recognize that DEI is also their responsibility? So in addition to their set of core beliefs that the company already had that were used to evaluate performance, we added a new metric around commitment to DEI. And um, that was then rolled out across the entire organization. So everyone at every level is measured on that. And we gave, of course, gave them some ideas, some thought starters um, for for everything from being uh, in an ERG and driving change, mentoring people, using inclusive tech language. Um, You know, those were just some of the examples of how you could be active. So they were things that were really attainable for everybody. And we made the comment and the focus that, you know, thinking about a commitment would be different. It's not one size fits all. What commitment to DEI looks like for someone like me who's been doing this work for 20 years, I should be in the advanced realm of what it is that I'm going to do to really extend my commitment. For someone who maybe is just starting to understand the space, theirs could be, you know, something that was really about educating themselves and reading some books or listening to a podcast like we're doing. And so we really tried to make um, this spectrum of what you could do um, be attainable. And so we rolled that out, um, actually just finished our uh, review cycle in March for that. And now that is a part of the way that we evaluate performance and help people understand in the company that it's an expectation of everyone. You know, and just amazing, um, quantitative, qualitative accountability. These are all things we've talked about. Um, you know, you and I share a belief that you've got to drive this down in the organization. And, and I've heard you say, you know, we can't just think about DEI as an HR focused strategy, but as a lever that needs to be driven in partnership with other business functions. Tell me a little bit more about how you're achieving that. How are you getting different business units to buy into this? 
I think it really starts with framing the work um, and letting people know what DEI work really is. And so I'm a huge fan of the workforce, workplace, marketplace, community framework, because I think when you lay that out, I I typically show it visually as as a house with four pillars and each of those things are the pillars. And then the foundation of that house are things like metrics and accountability and communication and, um, you know, leadership commitment. And so when you you can, one, graphically show people what is DEI work, what is a holistic DEI strategy, and then you're able to then drive down into each of those pillars and to show that the work is more than just HR. Now, certainly a lot of the workforce and workplace initiatives either are owned by different HR functions or done in partnership with HR. But guess what? Even business leaders have to be responsible for things like talent acquisition and talent management and culture and, um, you know, performance management and and learning and development, right? And so it, it allows you to then open up the conversation, even in the HR areas that leaders and managers and everyday employees are responsible also for this work. And then when you show it in that way, you're then able to go deep into the marketplace, which to me, DEI should be seen as an enabler of a company's business strategy. So then you can have a conversation with uh, the teams that are driving products and say, you know, how are we developing products and are they inclusive? What does our product assortment look like? You can have a conversation with the marketing team around uh, marketing and your customer segmentation strategy. Are we really driving growth as an organization? because we're tapping into different market segments. You can have a conversation with the procurement team that talks about supplier diversity and are our vendors and suppliers inclusive. You can have a conversation uh, uh, talking about community as well with, um, you know, what are we doing externally? Who are our external partners and how are we investing in the communities where we live and work philanthropically? What is our strategy and how does that all align? And so for, for me, we have to, oftentimes organizations focus so much on the what? What should we be doing when it comes to DEI? I always pull back and say, how? How should we be thinking about DEI? What is our structure and framework? And then we can talk to the what once we understand how we're going to approach the work. I love this. And I think that for a lot of people, it, you're right. They do fo- have that one minded focus, but your how is really the important piece. So DEI is, is often viewed as, as HR work and chief diversity officers typically will report into HR. Can you share your perspective, Tamika, on how to approach DEI and what the partnership between HR and DEI really should look like? ideal world. So I have pretty strong feelings in this space. And, uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit controversial because I would say probably in the benchmarking I've done, two thirds of CDA roles still report into HR. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a bit of a shift. I will say certainly in the last year, I'm seeing more uh, CDOs report into business functions, but HR is definitely, you know, still the norm. And by no means, as I just articulated, am I saying that DI work does not touch and should not have, you know, be involved with HR. In fact, HR is instrumental in driving change when it comes to DI. But I think HR should be a partner um, to the CDO and be viewed as just as the CMO is a partner, just as the, uh, you know, uh, COO is a partner, CMO, et cetera. And the CHRO should also be viewed as a partner to the DEI team. If we also think about some of the work that is required with DEI, particularly the E part, we're talking about dismantling systems, processes, structures that we know are inequitable. And we know they're inequitable because we can see the data back to the metrics and we see that things are not the way they should be. Many of those processes are owned by HR. So to me, it is a conflict of interest to have DEI, who is responsible for driving equity, report into an organization, HR, that also owns some of the processes where the inequity sits. So that's another reason why I feel that if DEI is viewed as a partner to a CHRO to say, we are in this together, 
we drive impact and change together. And how do we do that in partnership with each other, as opposed to a reporting relationship or even sometimes, um, you know, an adversarial relationship? It can be depending on how a team is structured from a DEI perspective within HR. Sometimes it's it's marginalized and it's two clicks down. And so they're not even in the conversations where they should be talking about how do we change processes and how do we drive equity? So to me, a partnership, an instrumental partner in driving change, but one of many partners that are a part of driving uh, business outcomes. Tamika, you and I share this belief. It is controversial. It is something I am so passionate around that I think many organizations have gotten wrong and it's trending in the wrong direction. So what I want to do is invite you in uh, for another episode. So I'm going to give all the, our listeners a teaser that Jeff and Tamika are going to uh, kind of attack this uh, paradigm of, of CDO and, and CHRO on our next episode. So Amanda, how's that for a, for a little tease to get <laughs> There you uh, go. There controversial you go. And, and we want to put, you know, something out there for people to talk about. But anyways, Tamika, thank you so much for joining us to share your insights on HR and DE&I. Um, we're going to have you back again in a few okay. weeks, and we're going to explore this a little deeper. Follow Tamika Curry-Smith on LinkedIn to stay up with her current work and new initiatives. Additionally, uh, for information about her company and her work, please go to the tcsgroupinc.com, and we will post that on our website. But for now, Tamika, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and look forward to round two. Thanks again for joining us for Wind Down Wednesdays a contemporary midweek discussion on current workplace and marketplace issues with a focus on diversity, inclusion, intersectionality, and equality. I'm Amanda Hammett, and on behalf of myself and Jeffrey Tobias Halter, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for joining us for Wind Down Wednesday. If you like this episode, please subscribe to receive more episodes straight to your inbox.